So the land acknowledgement is that I'm on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people in Mi'kmaq, Nova Scotia, Canada. And today we're talking about belonging in community. This is the big question. Sometimes we ask this or notice this with our conscious mind, but our primitive brain and our nervous system are always on the job. This is their main priority, their only priority, really. So our brain gathers all this data through the senses, and there's some interesting research on that around how many millions of impressions the visual part of the brain takes in, and almost entirely what it does, and this really affects how we belong in community, is it looks at everything through the lens of the past. If it was safe in the past, then it's going to ignore it. If it was unsafe in the past, it will bring up an alert. And when we're looking at community, we're looking at a flawed system. So this system worked well when our threats were more like predators jumping out from behind bushes, like tigers and lions, things like that. It doesn't work very well in our social settings. So that's part of why we're bringing in these conscious mind perceptions and thoughts and evaluation and reflections is we don't want to just be run by our primitive brain. So we have this ventral ladder again, the freeze, where we're really just kind of shut down, the fight or flight, which we're all familiar with, and then the ventral vagal, the trust and connection. And in order to really feel like we belong, we need to be in that trust and connection. Otherwise, if we're in fight, flight, freeze, we're not even going to notice if there's safety there. If someone kind of wants us to be there, they're happy we're there. If we're really shut down, we're not even going to notice that. We're not going to take it in. As with everything, our nervous system is really important. And then today we're going to look at the conditioning. So we have this negativity bias, but we not only have the negativity bias of what's happening in the present, so we're more likely to assess something as threatening when it's not. But the way the brain works with our history is that we look at all of the things that happened in the past assessed from our childhood relative level of powerlessness. So that a lot of the evidence that we bring in is actually not credible evidence for an adult. It belongs to our childhood perception. So we have all the conditioning, the stereotypes, the media, the fear, all of that stuff going on. And then we have the higher level brain development, of course, that we have as humans, we have emotions, we have good heartedness, we have all these things. But our primitive brain is still running the show in the background. And that's what's driving a lot of the catastrophic thoughts or the fight, flight and freeze. So it's very helpful to Pay attention to that. So Rosma Menicum's beautiful book, My Grandmother's Hands, is just full of exercises and practices to come into a feeling of groundedness and connectedness. And this quote really sums up what we're talking about here. The body has a sense of safety or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, it will do almost anything to establish or recover that sense of safety. So as we're working with our own internal relationship with ourselves, and maybe we're being shamed by the inner critic, if we're working with our relationship with other people, it all comes down to, does our body feel safe? So that's a good thing to know. All right. So notice now, just as we're, as we're doing this, we always want to be coming back in to the groundedness in our body, our breath. And as we go through this practice on social location, and we're going to do that on the next slide, it's really interesting to see where we are in relation to the power at the center. And if we think about it as a circle, the power at the center, and then as we go out towards the margins, there's less and less power. So unless you're a rich, white, healthy, middle, you know, 40-ish male, you are in the margin on some of those determinants. So nobody else is completely in the middle of the power. And we all have places in our identity where we have more or less access to power. So we're not looking at it as a, a shaming kind of a thing. We're really just looking at it as a 
like a scientist. Where am I on, on that? So the bottom corner there, Mark Tewksbury, is a white male Olympian, gold medalist, and he was gay. He came out as a gay man. Uh, Stephen Hawking was not able-bodied, and yet his mind compensated for that. And he was highly respected. And they even named that voice that he used, the artificial voice, after him, and nobody else could use it. They kind of copyrighted it. So we're looking at, you know, I used to be a waitress, coffee shop waitress, and then as I got a little bit more experience, I was able to work in bars where you got a lot better tips or in evening shifts. And so a lot of people made assumptions about who I was because of my social location. My, my position as a coffee shop waitress, for instance, is not a highly respected position in our society, obviously. And so we all have these places where we're, where we're defined by our identity and certain, comp, you know, certain aspects of our identity. So let's go right into the inquiry. And we're going to take quite a bit of time here. So if you wanted to have some, a journal or something, and I'll go through them. I should go through them because not everybody's probably looking at a screen. As you're doing this, what we're, what we're looking at is how these things have affected us. So maybe I'll run through them and I'll just kind of name some of mine and then I'll be quiet for a while and you can really get into yours. So as a 68-year-old woman, I'm not as respected in our kind of culture. In some cultures, elders are very respected. North American culture, not so much. I'm female. I'm cisgender, which means I'm, I feel like I'm in the right body for who I feel like. I feel like I'm a woman, and I'm in a woman's body. My gender expression is as a woman. My sexual orientation is as a lesbian. And I certainly had the impact of that heteronormativity on my life. And I could go into some of those things. And has it changed? Absolutely. So when I was first coming out in my early 20s, being a lesbian was very different than it is now. The risks were different. The access to power or not was different. Race, so I'm a white woman settler in Canada. I'm in the social economic class of middle class. I was that in my childhood, and I also experienced poverty as a single mother in my 20s. And then now I have more, more economic security again. My ability levels, I'm pretty able-bodied. I'm pretty smart. I've got pretty good mental health, pretty good nervous system. That certainly wasn't always the case. My body size, I was a, a small body size or normal body size until, or a common body size, until I was in my mid-20s. And then I developed a binge eating disorder and I've had a large body for most of my life. I had a period of time, about 10 years, where I had a more regular size body. And then I gained weight again. So I have that and I can certainly, I could talk, talk a lot about the impact that that's had on my life and how other people view me based on that. And I live in Canada, which has a pretty stable social democratic political system, depending on a lot of other social determinants, where your social location is. But as a white 68-year-old woman who has fairly good financial security, that really gives me a lot of freedom in my life. And then... The, the last part about proximity to others with different social locations is I was thinking about my mother who has a lesbian daughter and she didn't really like having a lesbian daughter, but it did give her some understanding of what it might be like that she wouldn't have had otherwise. And for me, as someone who's pretty able-bodied, she had a, a condition in her leg that, that uh, would have required either amputation and she ended up dying from it. So I have an experience of what it was like for her as a woman in her 80s going through the healthcare system. So just to really set the stage of how complex this is and how these are conditions, these social locations that we don't create for ourselves, that we haven't set up the system, that this is a systematic oppression in many cases or a systematic advantage or privilege. So let's go into this now. Let's take 
you know, for five to 10 minutes to really explore this. What are some of these elements for you? And as you're doing this, really keep grounded in your body. Notice your breath and notice when something changes. If you're looking at one particular thing and you're noticing that suddenly you're clenching your teeth or you've stopped breathing, just to make a mental note or a note of that. And as you're working with them, notice if there's any shaming. If you're shaming yourself for being in a position of relative power about something, or if you're feeling shame, things are coming up, you can always do some tapping on your forehead. Open your eyes, put it in a frame on the other side of the room. So take care of yourself as you're doing this. This is really more of an observation. And sometimes that will, of course, bring things up. But see if you can stay grounded and kind as you're working with these. If you feel like you've gone through and named a lot of the, your locations, you could go more deeply into one or two of them, like um, interaction with people of other races. For instance, I grew up in a very segregated, white, small town, 
And then as I got a little bit older, then I started to have more access and more interaction. So you could also look at what was the impact of your social location around some of those details of how that works. Or if you had a larger size body and then had a not larger size body, what was the impact of that? We'll keep working on this for maybe another minute or so, and then we'll come back to the next slide. All right, now bring yourself back to the screen and there are pictures of two different men on the screen. And as you're looking into the eyes of one and then the other, just go back and forth a little bit and notice your nervous system response. And these might be people that you know who they are, they might not be. The next slide will show that. Just to notice what your, what your perceptions of those people are. How do you feel in your nervous system as you look at them? And we're looking now into our conditioning, which just as a reminder is not conscious mind, it's our unconscious mind. We've been conditioned to these things. So the black man is David Lammy, an MP, a member of parliament in, in the UK. And our conditioning is to believe that Black men in hoodies especially are dangerous to us. They're a threat to us. So he's part of a project of, it's called 56 Black Men, which is very interesting to just look it up online. And it's just 56 black men in hoodies that have all kinds of different stories. So it's interesting to, to check our stereotypes and our conditioning against that. And then Brock Turner, some of you probably recognize that. His picture is a rapist, convicted rapist. And one of the things that happens with women primarily, but also with some men, is that we don't know who the men are who are going to be sexual predators. And this clean-cut kind of all-American swim team from Stanford, this man, is not somebody that we would probably look at and go, he's a rapist, and yet he, he is. And so when we don't have enough personal experience with somebody or some group of people, we use our conditioning, we fall back on our stereotypes and our conditioning. So that's a, a fact, and it's not something that we need to be feeling shame about, although often we will. It's more just to, can we be aware that this is how it is? We fear people, we're conditioned, our nervous system is conditioned to, to fear people who are unlike us, who are not like us. So if we go back to the social location, that really plays into this as well. So now we're gonna pause here again and look at how we fit in. So we have a couple of different things. One is a girls hockey team. One is Greta Thunberg. When she started the climate strike, she was really all by herself with that. And then a, a family group. So, Probably our families of origin are where we feel we feel this at first, and then we get into school and other places. But oftentimes we don't really feel like we fit in, or we can't really reveal who we really are if we want to be accepted. So we develop these habits and patterns of holding back and managing 
how much authenticity and how much we really share who we are. So let's kind of sit with that for a bit. What does it feel like? Where do you fit in? Where do you feel like I really fit in here? And where do you feel like eh, a little bit? I could say some things, not others. Let's explore this a little bit. What does it feel like in your body? As you're working with this, stay grounded, be aware of your breath, let your body be relaxed. And this need and want to belong is something that we all share, that we can get along somewhat without it, but our life is not very full and meaningful. We, we tend to have a lot of suffering when we don't belong. And so part of our history with this is that we don't feel like we can afford to be who we are, and then we hold back, and then we don't feel like we're included because we're not really open and vulnerable enough to be to be sharing who we really are and it never really feels all that satisfying to be included when we're hiding something so this is all just the way that it works for all of us and how we feel when we're included and how we feel when we're excluded is really important it's really high stakes so just for a moment before we move on to the next slide Let's kind of tune into a situation where you feel like, yeah, I really belong here. So it might be here in this group. I really belong here. Or it might be other things that come to mind. And notice what that feels like. What are your, what's happening in your body? What's happening in your breath? And you might be bringing people's faces to mind or experiences you've shared. It might be something that's a long time ago or really present now. I really belong here. And I'm sure it's universal for everybody that it feels very different when we feel like we belong than when we don't. And it's very important to us. So let's take the next several minutes just to kind of work with some of these. I belong here. So the first thing we have to really acknowledge is our nervous system history and how that impacts our felt sense of belonging. We're working with how it feels in our body, so we're not just working with the thoughts in our mind. And we don't have to all be the same. That's one thing we really experience in this community here. When people share, oftentimes we have a real resonance with what they share. We go, oh yeah, I know that experience. And other times we don't. We're listening to somebody express something that we don't know about or that's not how we feel about something. And yet there's a freedom here to be authentic. So there's a um, broadening our experience of who feels safe to be with can we cultivate that trust and connection in a wider community with people who aren't exactly like us so let's sit with that for a moment what does that feel like in terms of a possibility i'm strong enough to cultivate trust and connection with people who aren't just like me
And then let's come back to the group 